Um, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Brandon Bloch. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the history department here at UW-Madison. Um, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Sky Doney from the George L. Mossy program in history, uh, as well as Sophie Olson and Yana Vallejo from the history department who really did all of the work to make uh, the event today possible. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Mossy program, the history department, and the Center for German and European Studies for uh, supporting today's event. Um, so it's my great pleasure to virtually welcome to UW-Madison, Jeremy Best, um, who I met uh, now almost five years ago, which is uh, hard to believe at the Protestant Archive uh, in Berlin, who I've gotten to know over the years as a uh, very generous uh, and supportive colleague. Uh, Jeremy is Assistant Professor of History at Iowa State University. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland in 2012, and his research focuses on histories of race, religion, and culture in modern Germany and its colonial empire. Uh, Jeremy will be speaking about uh, his book, uh, Heavenly Fatherland, German, German Missionary Culture uh, and Globalization in the Age of Empire, um, which uh, has just appeared uh, with the University of Toronto Press. It's a fantastic book. I'd recommend it uh, to everybody. Uh, and in this work, Jeremy investigates the theological, cultural, and political activities of missionaries, mission societies, and missionary intellectuals in the context of Western imperialism and globalization. Uh, Jeremy is also beginning uh, a very interesting new project, uh, tentatively titled Toy Soldiering, West German Rearmament, the Holocaust in the United States, uh, which looks at how the birth of modern gaming culture uh, in both Germany and the US shaped uh, German-American relations and memories of World War II during the early Cold War. Uh, and Jeremy is also active as a Holocaust educator. Uh, he's a member of the Iowa Council for Holocaust Education and gives lectures to audiences in Iowa and beyond um, on the topic of white nationalism on college campuses. Um, so I know we're in for a real treat today, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jeremy Best. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Brandon. Uh, I'm going to share a screen, uh, which of course, as we all know, in these times requires a lot more effort than we wanted to. So uh, let me see if I can do it quickly. Uh, there we have it. Uh, you should all be seeing my PowerPoint. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, it was a real pleasure to accept the invitation from Sky and Brandon to speak today. And Brandon, thank you for that uh, really generous introduction. Uh, it, it was it was uh, a funny thing to meet uh, an American graduate student at a at a archive. Uh, Brandon was a graduate student at the time, and I was just finished with my PhD, uh, doing the follow up research to finish up this project uh, at a, at a, this archive that I had not encountered that many scholars in. Uh, but it was a real pleasure. Uh, it's especially cool for me to be hosted by the George Mossy program. As many of us know, Mossy occupies a lot of real estate when it comes to the field of history, especially German history. Uh, and to be associated with his name in any way is an honor. I'm similarly pleased to be a guest of the Department of History and the Center for German and European Studies, both of which host and support phenomenal scholarship. I hope that my presentation, drawing from the research and conclusions that went into my book, will be stimulating to everyone here. I look forward to your questions after my presentation. Newly ordained Johannes Warneck of Domitsch, Saxony arrived at the Dutch East Indian port of Sebolga on the western coast of Sumatra in 1892. Shuttled to the pier on a ship's launch, he had ample opportunity to take in the island's green mountains rising above the port. It would be into those mountains that Warneck would soon travel to Sifilon in the highlands. There he was to establish a new mission station among the Batak speaking people for his employer, the Rhenish Mission Society. After his long journey from Germany, it was easy to imagine Varnick pausing for a moment on the jetty, his eyes taking in the small city of Sebolga, the coffee plantations spreading up the hillsides above the city, and the forested mountains beyond. Along with his physical possessions, Varnick brought with him the decades-old traditions of German Protestant mission. His arrival in Sumatra was like millions of others happening in those decades. People setting off and showing up as transnational networks of exchange shrank the globe. Thousands of German missionaries made such journeys between 1860 and 1914. Like all of these arrivals, Varneck still had a long way to go. For now, ahead of him lay the road to Sefali. 18 years later, 
Johannes Varnack stood upon a jetty. This time, he carried nearly two decades of experience as a missionary on Sumatra with him. Looking shoreward from the quay at Leith, Varnack would have taken in the densely packed buildings of Edinburgh, bricks piled upon bricks up the hillsides, eventually reaching Edinburgh Castle. Sebulga was an ending and a beginning for Varnack, the end of his training, the beginning of his career. Edinburgh was an ending and a beginning for the German Protestant missionary movement writ large. It marked the end of the Germans' quest for allies in their missions, and the beginning of a new age of missionary cooperation, or so they thought. In 1910, Varnick was one of 60 German delegates sent to participate in the World Missionary Conference. The conference promised, at the time, to bring together all the world's Protestant missionaries. It was the largest and most influential convening of its kind. Its attendees, especially its German attendees, believed themselves to be cementing an alliance that would lead to the total Christianization of the world. My book, Heavenly Fatherland, tells the story of Varnack and the thousands of other German Protestants who participated in the missionary movement. It also tells part of the story of the hundreds of thousands of colonized people among whom the Germans worked. And it tells some of the story of the millions of Germans who supported the missionaries and consumed the messages they sent home. Johannes Varnack is an important missionary. He established a seminary at Safalen for indigenous preachers, became a member of the Rhenish Mission Society's board, and in Edinburgh, his expertise in mission methods earned him an honorary doctorate. Nevertheless, he is just one among many figures in Heavenly Fatherland. Others are men like these pictured here at a gathering from 1889 in Bremen. Much more relevant for us today is the interpretive framework suggested by these two moments on the jetty. In those moments, we see German Protestants, the colonial mission field, and the international mission community all at once. Today, I will share how these moments are connected by the missionary's history. Their ideas and activities illustrate a new relevance for understanding an old history, part of and the ongoing history of German Protestantism. The narrative I will present draws on my research and retells the main argument of my book. In today's story, I will describe the imagined internationalist community that German Protestant missionaries thought themselves a part of. This view meant they had little interest in the colonial projects of Germany's secular colonial movement. Before the 1880s, this autonomy was relatively easy to maintain. However, as the 19th century ended, enemies to the missionaries' work began to appear. The missionaries had always seen themselves as in mortal combat with the forces of heathendom, but in the 1890s, they began to encounter new, ostensibly Christian opponents. These opponents seemed arrayed against the missionaries and their goals. In response, the missionaries sought out new allies. And in the sealing of these alliances, the missionaries revealed themselves to be both pragmatic creatures of the world and simultaneously validated in their most fantastic dream that a global coalition of Protestants could be created. A coalition that could link German missionaries and congregations of colonized people, like in these pictures, into a global community of Christians. The German Protestant missionary movement predates formal German colonialism by at least 80 years. In that time before the conquest of an overseas empire, the mission societies existed comfortably without fear of nationalist interference. Circumstances allowed them to develop a self-understanding that defined their work as godly, international, and independent. Missionary theorists and leaders like Gustav Warneck, Johannes Warneck's father, Franz Michael Zahn, Reinhold Grundemann, and Alexander Morensky imagined themselves as members and architects of an international community of faith committed to the creation of a Christian world. They imagined themselves encircled by God's promise of unity in Christ and judged themselves inheritors of the apostles' mission to unite humanity. This understanding led them to believe they should, could, and would create a global community of Protestants, diverse in their national and racial identities, but united in their faith. The theology Varnack and his associates created permeated the lower ranks of Germany's Protestant missions. Through domestic work to fundraise and promote mission Christianity, the theology also suffused many German Protestants religious life. That message can be seen in the banner for a popular mission periodical, the Evangelischen Missionen. Around the images of the world is the scriptural passage, 
the heathen will be transformed in your light, understood by the missionaries to be a prophecy of Jesus Christ's powerful message of conversion. Placing that passage around an image of the world captured their expectation that their work was global in scheme. The second passage around an ascended, ascended Christ, come to me all of you that are weary and burdened, conveyed the inclusive promise of Christianity. Produced for a popular audience, the Evangelische Missionen conveyed the values of Germany's Protestant missionaries through images and messages like this. I argue that this historical reality demonstrates the multiplicity of colonial visions in German culture. The tendency to generalize colonial intentions and behavior flattens our understanding of the past. That tendency is to view Germany's global activities before World War I through the lens of military and racial aggression especially when the view is zoomed out far enough to include the Nazi years. It is my position that missionaries produced a different vision of Germany's place within the world. Even more so, they thought themselves to be living in a world full of potential for revolutionary transformations. As key participants in Germany's colonial project, this alternative vision was important. The missionaries were of the world, but believed they could manifest a different version of their world out of the global, industrial, capitalistic transformations spreading across their country, their country's colonies, and the world. Germany conquered a colonial empire in the same colonial frenzy that seized other industrial states during the 1880s. And like the other powers, it expanded its empire in succeeding decades. Though some German missionaries supported European colonial expansion, the main advocates for empire were secular. Mercantilists and light industrialists joined liberal and conservative nationalists to successfully mobilize a wave of popular energy and force Otto von Bismarck government to establish the empire. Nationalist pressure helped drive successful and unsuccessful attempts to expand that empire during the reign of Kaiser Wilhelm II in the 1890s and after the turn of the 20th century. The advocates of colonial annexations expected that Germany's missionaries would eagerly serve the colonial project. When they did not, as I shall explain, the secular imperialists became the first and most consistent adversaries of the missionaries. Conflict with the secular colonialists encouraged the missionaries search for new allies. At the same time, globalization's railroads, telegraphs, and steamships, whose scope is captured in part by this map of the North German Lloyd steamship line, created connections the missionaries could exploit. New networks of communication created networks of imagined identity that could bring together a community of missionaries. Friendly relations with foreign mission societies were not new to the Germans. The first Germans to go into the field did so in the early decades of the 18th century as part of a Danish mission to India. And some of the first missionaries sponsored by British mission societies in the 1790s were recruited in Germany. But in the last decades before World War I, new possibilities emerged for global connection and collaboration. Germany's Protestant missionaries saw opportunity to make real the community of evangelization they imagined. Through international networks of missionaries, they believed they could consecrate a grand alliance against their secular and spiritual enemies. At first, as I have said, the mission societies had little need of allies. But once their work became entangled with Germany's colonial project, their internationalism drew critiques from secular sources. Two examples from the colony of Germany, German East Africa show how they resisted. When independent resistance proved insufficient, I will show how pragmatic compromises with the colonial state became a tool for the mission societies and allowed them to remain true to their internationalism. Missionswissenschaftler, theologians of mission, applied a concept drawn from the theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher for their own purposes. A century of tradition and experience crafted a strategy of evangelization that integrated Schleiermacher's Volkskirche theory that the church should belong to its congregants. Once a missionary like Johannes Warneck arrived in a virgin territory, he was expected to learn the local languages and establish schools that would teach in the most promising local tongue. Warneck's father, Gustav, explained it, quote, man thinks in his native language. It is the mirror of the spirit which enlivens him. And as with the individual, it is the same with the nations. The national soul comes to the word through the national language, end quote. These policies ran directly counter to secular plans for the colonies. 
While secular opponents wanted them to teach in German and train African people to work for capitalist enterprises, the missionaries' internationalism led them to promote indigenous language instruction and to oppose the project of education of the Negro to work, Etzion de Negres zur Arbeit. By the 1890s, Germany's Protestant mission movement had an intellectualized, academic, and internationalist character. This orientation arose from the leadership of Gustav Farnack, father of Johannes, and his establishment of academic mission studies in Germany. Missionswissenschaft had its strongest outlet in Warnick's journal, the Allgemeine Missionszeitschrift, begun in 1874 with the ambit to bring attention to, quote, culturally and religious, historical, geographic, ethnological, and similar questions that could be studied in order to professionalize, rationalize, and maximize the work of missionaries, end quote. Such an engagement with the contemporary intellectual world encouraged Warnick and his colleagues to articulate a clear relationship to secular concerns. And with no hesitation, the Missionswissenschaftler insisted that the furtherance of the Christian gospel had primacy over all of those secular concerns. The theological argument made in the Allgemeine Missionszeitschrift dominated among Germany's missionary leaders. They argued that any categorization of humanity beyond the division between Christians and non-Christians had no meaning. Secular political concerns corroded and demeaned missionary activities and nationalistic competition disrupted the holy work of mission societies. As a consequence, Franz Michael Zahn, leader of the North German Mission Society, argued against any, quote, sickly overemphasis of national feeling and immoral patriotism, end quote, in missionary work. As Warneck summed it up in 1901, quote, mission should not make the peoples into Germans, Englishmen, Frenchmen, or Russians. It should make them into Christians. And so these four missionary friends, Johannes Fronmeier, Herr Gauza, Adolf Mohr, and Christoph Eugen Meyer might have come from German-speaking Basel, but abroad it was their Protestant Christianity that mattered the most. This photograph captures the sense that missionaries had of their interconnected purpose no matter where they were in the world and that they were part of some shared project. The missionaries' aversion to particularistic priorities and elevation of Christian universalism shaped their attitudes and policies. Enabled in the 1880s to expand their proselytizing work into new territories, Germany's Protestant missionaries brought to their labors a specific commitment to the primacy of indigenous languages. The German Protestant mission movement drew strength from the pietist movement of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Pietists had and continued to gather in small study circles to pray and study the Bible, elevating in this way the personal encounter with the gospels and grounding their faith in an intimate encounter with the language of that faith. The expectation that one follow the narrow way as captured in this popular artwork from the German lands among the pietists, as opposed to the worldly and treacherously easy broad way also shown in this image conveys the serious purpose the missionaries inherited. Missionaries integrated these pietistic instincts with a German fascination with the importance of language to national identity. As a result, they insisted missionaries should learn and teach in the local languages of their prospective congregants. The missionaries' comfort and familiarity with linguistically driven groupings derived from their application of Schleiermacher's concept of the Volkskirche. Schleiermacher was the preeminent rationalist Protestant theologian of the modern era. Working in the early 19th century, he emphasized the centrality of language to human existence. The principle of the Volkskirche, particularly as applied to the missionaries, held that each identifiable folk, roughly defined in our own terms as a people or a nation, should organize itself into its own church. Furthermore, that church should belong to the congregants and not any outside authority. Under these circumstances, each folk could grow and develop its own relationship to God. To the missionaries, evangelization meant implanting the seed of a folk's kirka among its folk. Otto Schott, director of the Basel Mission Society, explained it as the creation of the three self. Mission churches should develop into autonomous churches that were self-financed, self-administered, and self-propagating of the gospel, i.e. that they themselves should be undertaking mission work beyond their borders. Varnack and other missions with Schaffler agreed, encouraging missionaries in the field to develop their congregants' folkish identities as they work to eradicate the superstitions and sins supposedly present in those societies. 
As part of this work, missionaries set out to identify and cultivate an indigenous folk spraka or national language, encourage what they called natural communal forms, start schools, and guide the establishment of these new Christian communities. Once a folk's kirka became autonomous, it was expected that it would grow to encompass the entirety of its folk and bring that nation to God's service. The primacy of indigenous language can be illustrated in a small way by this photograph of the interior of a mission church at Rungva in German East Africa. Photographed by the Moravian missionary Paul Theodor Meyer, who also offered the translation of the Nyakusa Ngonde text as the Lord is coming and praise the Lord all ye lands, you can see again the emphasis upon indigenous language. The creation of a folks kirka was obviously a campaign of ethnicization. That is the imposition of a missionary defined ethnicity upon a community whose true contours were often illegible to the missionaries. That colonial pro program was, however, not a program of Europeanization. German missionaries did not set out to eradicate cultural difference in order to create communities that mirrored European Christianity. Missionaries' insistence on the truth and superiority of some kind of Christianity guaranteed their work would be intrusive, but it is remarkable the seriousness with which the missionaries sought to avoid wholesale cultural destruction. This runs counter to the general behaviors of other missionary nations. Many British worked in the tradition of David Livingston and promoted British commerce and culture as part of Christian conversion, and the French Protestant missionaries were well known for their accommodations to the French colonial government. Karl Buchner, a Moravian missionary leader, argued that people of African descent were spiritually equal to Europeans. Buchner's colleague, Theodor Beckler, agreed, insisting that the Conde, among whom he worked, were culturally equal to whites. The process of creating a folks kirka began with the establishment of schools for young children and was paired with campaigns to translate the gospels and eventually the entire Christian Bible into a local language. For example, pictured here is a more modern sample from a Niamwezi Bible, the first portions of which appeared in 1897 with a completed New Testament in 1909, all this undertaken by German missionaries with the support and assistance of uh, Niamwezi uh, collaborators and translators. As Varnick put it, quote, Christianity comes to the peoples as a foreign religion. And this foreign religion can only become indigenous to these peoples if they can grasp it in their mother tongue, end quote. As a result, missionaries designed their schools to, to deliver basic literacy in a local language. The goal of this education, according to one leading missionary, was that the indigenous student grow to lead in his own affairs. German language instruction offered little value to the creation of a true Volkskirche. As a result, mission schools restricted basic instruction of the German language to the upper grades. Julius Richter, eventual inheritor of Gustav Farnack's role as leading Missionswissenschaftler, argued that the project of cultural elevation, pedagogical principles, and the missionary's goal to create a solid native community required instruction remain in indigenous vernaculars. The missionary's stated and consistent passion for the realization of their imagined Christian international put them directly at odds with other constituencies of Germany's colonial empire. Liberal-minded imperialists sought to create a Germanized empire that could become a site for the expansion of German national, economic, and military power. Such imperialists were soon joined by conservative patriotic associations who put particular emphasis on the realization of German global hegemony. To them, indigenous language carried out by the missionaries and their use of it in instruction was an affront to German prestige and power. Starting in the 1890s, the leaders of the chief secular colonial association, the German Colonial Society, pressed the German colonial administration to require German language instruction. In 1896, Duke Johann Elbrecht zu Mecklenburg, head of the colonial society, claimed that for patriotic reasons, German language instruction should be mandated in colonial schools. Two years later, Mecklenburg pressed on, this time submitting a memorandum to the colonial administration, arguing that, quote, we must act as the French and English. We must show the natives that we Germans are the masters, end quote. Colonial director Paul Kaiser agreed that Germans had a national responsibility to teach their language in the colonies. Other colonial bureaucrats acted in concert with the colonial society. In the colony of Cameroon, the governor pressured the Basel mission to reform its curriculum. And in 1904, Governor Julius von Seck joined with the nationalist and economic interests in the colony of Togoland 
to put similar pressure on the missionaries. In every one of these cases, the stated argument of the secular colonialists was that German mission schools should reflect German cultural supremacy. Supremacy over indigenous cultures, but also over other European cultures. Missionaries internationalism provided them with the principles for resisting this pressure. Missionary intellectuals ridiculed the chauvinism of German nationalists and defended indigenous cultures as positive forces of identity for missionized people. Franz Michael Zahn argued that it was clearly God's intention to instill humanity with great diversity. Education in indigenous languages was healthy, he declared, and moral instruction was better achieved through local languages. Eventually, through Christian evangelization, humanity could be reunited into one great people with broad understanding of God's message and sanctified in the union of God's love. Zahn wrote, the use of indigenous language for evangelization, therefore, opened the door to the most expansive philosophical, philological, historical, and theological considerations. Karl Meinhof, famed linguist and mission scholar, wrote that, quote, every non-European finds beauty in the gospel that we Europeans do not see. Missionaries' theological commitment to run their schools in their own way provided them with the determination to turn aside these attempts to force German language instruction. Between 1890 and 1908, the mission societies used finesse and partial compromise to preserve their curricula. But the pressure was unrelenting, and so the compromises grew more onerous for the mission societies. Expansions of mission schools demanded more financial support. In return for that support from the colonial governments, the mission schools agreed to expand some German language instruction. But the missionaries did not give up their overriding commitment to teach in a language familiar and comfortable to local communities. In the last years before World War I, Karl Oxenfeld, new director of the Berlin Mission Society, found a way to preserve the missionaries' commitment to local languages while fending off secular nationalist demands. Unlike Warneck and others, Axenfeld was born after German unification and felt less aversion to the forms of German statehood. He celebrated the technologies of modernity that had, as he described it, smashed a hole in the Great Wall of China, opening that country up to uh, colonial missionization. Consequently, he was open to negotiations. In German East Africa, pressure for German language instruction was somewhat weaker, making possible a compromise. He wrote in a 1908 essay that the missionaries should collaborate with the colonial government on language policy. By joining with the colonial government under Governor Albrecht zu Reckenberg, he argued they could outflank and deny secular colonialists their goals. His proposed compromise was to implement Swahili instruction. He stressed that Swahili was already widely spread across the colony. Many of the colony's African inhabitants saw it as a language of prestige, and the language was favored by the colonial administration. Axenfeld's proposed compromise soon took hold. The colonial state and mission societies worked together to spread the language across the colony. Missionaries could still claim that they were working to meet their congregants' cultural needs. The colonial state increasingly made use of Swahili in government and could rely on trained assistants and clerks from the mission schools. The missionaries could claim a second advantage, the refusal of German language instruction and a new ally in defense of that ongoing refusal. In the few years before World War I, momentum for colonial reform and investment rolled through the German colonies. In the wake of costly and genocidal wars against Herero and Namaqua people in German Southwest Africa and devastating suppression of the Maji Maji uprising in German East Africa, a new colonial ministry was formed in Berlin. The new colonial minister, Bernhard Gernberg, committed his bureaucrats to a new uh, rational, as he put it, colonialism designed to reorient colonial policy toward financial security and better maintain order in the colonies. It was in this context that Axenfeld's Swahili language compromise came into being. And would be in this context that missionaries would find common ground with the colonial administration once again, this time on economic and labor policy in German East Africa. While it was nationalist colonialists who focused on the role that colonies could play in propagating German cultural power and therefore sought to force instruction in Germany, it was a different group of colonialists, though there was of course significant overlap, who pressed for policies designed to maximize the economic exploitation of African populations in East Africa. As part of that strategy, one merchant established the German colonial house in Berlin as a showplace for German colonial goods. And in this argument, secular colonialists insisted that central to all policies in the colonies should be the education of the Negro to work, at Siung des Negus zu Arbeit. Led by the Colonial Economic Committee of the German Colonial Society, 
economic colonialists pressed for policies that would ensure a docile and reliable labor supply for large plantations, mining operations, and transportation, all to ensure a stable and profitable supply of colonial goods to Germany. The commercial colonialists agreed with the nationalists that Africans should be taught enough German language to understand orders and instructions. But more important to them was training Africans to efficiently function within capitalist labor systems. An example would be at this, uh, these photographs from a Cecil plantation uh, where the industrialized and uh, capitalized aspirations are clear in the use of machinery for harvest on the left and uh, with the use of a steam press on the right, which was used for processing Cecil fibers. The machine uh, would isolate the Cecil agave fibers for eventual use in coarse textiles. Uh, and in both of these instances, you can see the emphasis upon uh, export goods and mass production. In contrast, nearly every German Protestant missionary believed that educating the Negro to work did little for African people. The missionaries brought with them to the African context and inherited ambivalence toward modern capitalism. Back in Germany, they had contacts with religious activi activities and activists who worked to, to ameliorate poverty in Germany caused by the Industrial Revolution and the pace of industrial change. And from that experience, the missionaries recognized the consequences of unfettered industrial activity. Missionaries feared that like in Europe, capitalistic exploitation in Africa would turn laborers towards socialism. The missionaries, Alexander Marinsky and Theodor Beckler warned that if mission societies educated the Negro to work, then Africans would rightly recognize missionaries as complicit in the exploitative plantation system. Missionaries united behind Varnick's reminder that Jesus had not sent his apostles into the world to teach the non-Christians to work. The apostles had been directed by Jesus to make those non-Christians followers of God. Entrusted by God, the missionaries refused secular pressure to change their pedagogical goals. What vocational training they provided was more often like the skills that would be gained in a furniture making workshop like this one, or similar artisanal or farming occupations. Bureaucratic assaults on the missionaries autonomy expanded from language policy into labor policy, putting the societies under expanding pressure through the beginning of the 20th century. However, the administration of Bernhard Danberg and the supportive governor of German East Africa, Albrecht von Reckenberg, provided an endorsement and encouragement to the missionaries' principled stand. The so-called Danberg reforms began after 1907 and reduced the influence of colonial interest groups by abolishing the colonial rot, a council of colonial lobbyists. A new system of recruitment, training, promotion, and authority for colonial officials also reduced the influence of those same uh, economic lobbyists. Partnered with Reckenberg in East Africa, Dernberg's reform agenda in the colony focused on the stimulation of agricultural production by African producers. Reckenberg eliminated the worst forms of corporal punishment, reduced the use of corvée labor, and shepherded through the planning and construction of a railroad across the waste of the colony. This railway, the Centralbahn, linked the area of densest African settlement in the west of the colony with the coastal ports and preempted the settler-favored Nordbahn that would have linked white-owned plantations in the north of the colony with the ports on the coast. Reckenberg's plan was meant to stimulate agricultural production for the market for African farmers and develop a more efficient and stable colonial economy. The mission societies were quick to grasp the potential collaboration offered by Reckenberg's policies. In their schools, they prioritized the education of their congregants to create individuals and communities that were economically independent. Because capitalist expansion would also stimulate the movement of labor, they recognized that the migration of labor desired by plantation owners threatened to disperse the carefully created communities of Christians that missionaries sought to create. For that goal, they supported the development of yeomen and artisans amongst their converts, men who would be more locally grounded and who would be the basis for a future Volkskirche. The compromise on language instruction brokered by Karl Axenfeld provided a model for understanding a second possible compromise, this one which expanded around labor policy. Richter, an ally of Axenfeld, explained that missions and administrators through these two compromises had found common cause and now shared goals. He suggested that going forward, they could quote, march separately and attack in unison. The colonial administration's open prioritization of African producers placed them in alliance with the missionaries. 
Meanwhile, white settlers in the colony proclaimed the so-called irreversible superiority of Europeans and forbade any moral equality of black and white. This positioning highlights explicitly the vast gulf between missionaries and settlers. While settlers believed that uh, civilization would come to the colonies through white hegemony, the missionaries and colonial administration agreed that the same civilization would come through material and cultural uplift of African communities. I've outlined two examples of the way the missionaries lived their imagined internationalism. Their behavior in the mission field shows the alternative colonialism that they sought. That they came to an accommodation with the colonial state at the end does not negate their principled opposition to national service. The colonial state appeared more willing to grant them autonomy than secular interest groups, and so they found an accommodation. Though the missionaries eventually found some compromise with the German colonial state, the overriding truth is that they remained committed to their imagined internationalism. The examples given of language and labor policy help demonstrate the consequences for this behavior in Germany's colonies. Even as they struggled to preserve their integrity in the colonies, the German Protestant missionaries worked with diligence and efficiency in the international realm to forge lasting and durable alliances across borders. These alliances with Protestant missionaries in other countries promised to be the fullest execution of the Germans' internationalism. In the same years they found compromise with the colonial state, dreams of international community drew them onward. Germany's Protestant mission movement was something different, something important to understanding Germany, empire in the 19th century. The return to Edinburgh in 1910 with Johannes Warneck shows the missionaries' most profound internationalist ambitions. The 1910 World Missionary Conference was the culmination of three decades of German missionary advocacy. It was also perceived by them to have been a diplomatic council in which a new alliance for global evangelization was sealed. The Moravian missionary Otto Hennig thought the 10-day gathering in Edinburgh had brought together the entire Christian world, and Walter Trittelwitz of the Basel Mission Society thought the city had been transformed into the so-called spiritual center of the earth, the capital city of Christendom. Hennig, Trittelwitz, and other Germans were not alone in this estimation. Most delegates felt they had attended one of the great councils of the Christian church. And it was in Edinburgh that the development of Christian ecumenicism began, culminating in the formation of the World Council of Churches, founded in 1948, and eventually including 360 member churches from all around the world. 60 representatives of German Protestant mission traveled to the conference in 1910. The Germans believed that they would finally achieve the international coalition they had sought since international missionary conferences had begun in the late 1860s. Among them was Johannes Warnack. He, along with Julius Richter and Karl Meinhof, received honorary doctorates of theology, verifying the global reach of German Missionswissenschaft. That same year, Gustav Warnack received nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize and the Nobel Prize in Literature, another confirmation of German missionary influence. German missionaries, especially Gustav Warnack, had criticized previous incarnations of conferences as too narrow in their imagination. As far back as the 1878 General Missionary Conference in London, Varnack had argued that missionary conferences should abandon overtures to the wider mission public and instead focus on building an alliance among the various national mission movements. They could then pursue strategic solutions to shared issues like relations with colonial governments, the challenges posed by Catholic and Muslim religious expansion, and the sinful worldwide trade in cheap liquor. Two more conferences, the 1888 Centenary Mission Conference and the 1900 Ecumenical Missionary Conference drew praise from German mission leaders for drawing closer to their ideal, but it was the 1910 conference that realized the Germans' highest expectations. The Edinburgh Conference hosted 1,200 missionaries, mission society leaders, and theologians for a 10-day convention. There, according to Trittelwitz, the Protestant missionaries of the world forged a transnational fighting fraternity against the missionaries' enemies. This was not just idle hyperbole. Plans for Edinburgh had promised that no binding resolutions would be made during the conference. However, the spirit of evangelical unity moved the conference attendees to pass a joint resolution committing them to ongoing collaboration. And this resolution passed by general acclaim on the final day. In that resolution on that final day, the missionaries of the Protestant world created what they called a continuation committee the first sanctioned and official international form of missionary collaboration. The Continuation Committee would begin planning for future world missionary conferences, and in the interim, came to serve as an international body for cooperation among the mission societies. This resolution and its product were a concrete step toward 
an international organization of all missionaries and would fundamentally lead eventually to the World Council of Churches. The response to these events in Germany celebrated what was seen by the missionaries as an ecclesiastical council that would set the course to a new Protestant globe. Germany's Edinburgh delegation addressed the Christians of the world, declaring that the next decade would be a blessed turning point in human history. Julius Richter reported that the conference had been the greatest, most unforgettable occasion in Protestant mission culture. The creation of an institutionalized system of missionary collaboration signaled the real possibilities of missionaries imagined international community. Plans after the 1910 conference promised to bring together an alliance that would hopefully have helped missionaries in their struggle against secular nationalist and economic colonialists. In 1912, the Continuation Committee established the International Review of Missions, a journal, mission, a journal of mission scholarship, and began organizing a unified statistical agency for missionary work. Planning for a 1920 World Missionary Conference continued right up until the outbreak of World War I. One month before Germany declared war in 1914, Karl Axenfeld composed a memorandum for the Continuation Committee that called on it to award the 1920 conference to Berlin. He wrote, the goal of the next World Mission Conference must be to secure the unity of international mission and through that make Christians more willing and more effective for their service to non-Christian humanity. Unfortunately for the dreams of its members, World War I destroyed the German Protestant missionary movement. The British blockade cut the mission societies in Germany off from their mission fields. The missionaries in those mission fields were soon interred by the Entente powers, like these Germans from India and Africa detained by the British at Balari in India. Mission houses and seminaries became hospitals for convalescing soldiers. Mission finances disappeared in wartime inflation and economic destitution. The imaginary international of German missionaries, like many other dreams about an alternative 19th century, disappeared in artillery barrages and infantry charges over the top. My book argues that missionaries were central to Germany's colonial and global history. Their devotion to international independence and their work spilled over into their search for allies during the period of high imperialism before World War I. Recent scholarship on the German colonial empire has focused on colonial discourses and how they conveyed to the German public the empire's globality and colonial power. This work has neglected to include missionaries despite the expansive realities of missionary activity. The German missionary movement preceded any other active colonialist movement in Germany, and missionaries possessed extraordinary experience and knowledge of the colonial world. They used that extraordinary experience and knowledge to defend themselves against secular colonialists who sought to control missionaries' activities. When the pressure grew too great, German Protestant missionaries found allies in their empire's colonial administration and among co-religionists on both sides of the Atlantic. These activities encourage us to recognize that not everything in Germany's history before World War I pointed toward nationalist belligerence. There were those who saw globalization as an opportunity for connection, not as an inducement to conflict. Many scholars in German history have located the origins of Nazi racism in Germany's colonial empire and the genocide perpetrated against the Herero and Namaqua. My findings show that missionaries' role in Germany's relationship to colonialism and racial difference cannot be simplified so easily. It disrupts arguments that Germany had some sort of special form of colonialism and denies that the majoritarian view among Germans of racial difference was biologically understood by all. Missionaries viewed racial difference as a cultural issue and one that argued for a standard of uh, inclusivity to use our modern term that does not match prevailing notions about the colonizing imaginations of the time. The missionaries sought to remove themselves from the world of conquest, capitalist transformation, and racialized violence. This was, of course, impossible. Missionaries were yet another aspect of colonial power that came uninvited to remake the lives of colonized people. Differentiating them from other colonizing forces is important for understanding the nuance of colonization, but does little to redefine the fundamental relationship between Western colonizers and the conquered people of the colonies. On the other hand, recognizing that the missionaries had different intentions and a different vision from secular colonialists does redefine our understanding of the presence and persistence of religious ideas regarding human difference and cultural diversity during the 19th century. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions.